Now we know what leads a guitar string to sound the way that it does just when we pluck it. It's standing waves. And so a disturbance creates standing waves inside of there with different frequencies, and we hear those different frequencies at di as different pitches or different notes. Well, that's the same way with any stringed instrument. A guitar, a violin, a stand-up bass, all works in the same way. Uh, you might think, though, a violinist, they're not continually plucking the string, or they're not plucking the string to make the sound like a guitar. Well, they can if they wanted to, but typically a violinist, they've got like a bow that they draw across the string, uh, and that bow is essentially, as it's drawn across the string, it's like slipping and catching and slipping and catching in a very fast manner. And it's not like it's slipping and catching in the right frequency to create a standing wave, but it's every time it slips and catches, it's kind of like doing this and introducing disturbances which create standing waves in those strings. Well, that's the case for all stringed instruments, but what about non-stringed instruments? How did, like, what's going on to produce the sound and the notes that, that they produce and that we perceive? Well, think about a trumpet or a trombone or a tuba or a flute. What's inside of those uh, are not strings that vibrate. Well, inside of them are just columns of air, right? This is a tube that has a column of air inside of it. And just like a string, um, if we can disturb something, quick disturbance, what gets set up inside of there is a standing wave that will vibrate at a particular frequency or frequencies like we talked about with a guitar string. Um, and with a trumpet or a trombone or a flute, you're using your lips and blowing either, you know, the flute air across a hole that it's introducing disturbances, or with your lips, you're kind of like vibrating them like this back and forth. And that's just continually introducing disturbances, just like the, the, um, violin bow that's drawn across the string and what gets set up inside of the air inside of those instruments is a standing wave and so just to demonstrate that um, i'm going to play a note or notes uh, with this standing uh, wave of air and to introduce a disturbance i'm just going to take this and i'm going to kind of like slam it down in my hand and hold it and i want you guys to listen okay uh, so let's think about what I just did is when I slammed that against my hand, I'm introducing a disturbance. I'm kind of compressing the air and it's like moving through that column of air inside of there. And if I'm hearing a particular frequency, it's because it's setting up, setting up a standing wave with a particular frequency. Well, what what's going on inside of there? Well, um, when I do that and I leave my hand there, I've got one end that's closed over here and the other end that's open to the air. So I've got not two fixed ends for the air. I've got one kind of fixed end that's closed and one that's open. And that's the kind of standing wave that gets created. Well, what if I just kind of like slam it against my hand, but I don't leave my hand there, I take my hand away. So we'll do one with my leaving my hand there, one afterwards, and we'll see, does it sound any different? Is it the same kind of standing wave that gets created? So, ready? Okay, leaving my hand there taking it away. Very clearly there's different frequencies. There's a there's a higher pitch when I took my hand away than when I left it. So there must be different standing waves there. So when we create standing waves inside of a column of air, um, it matters whether there's one fixed end and an open end or two open ends that determines what kind of standing wave gets created. So we're gonna have to talk about what's going on, going on inside of there. And is this like strings? Well, like, would a half of a wavelength that the sound wave that you create make a standing wave in this with a closed end and an open end or two open ends? That's what we're going to investigate. So to help us figure out what's going on inside of a column of air when there's a standing wave inside of it, like we demonstrated before, that's producing a particular pitch or a particular frequency, uh, we need to figure out so that we can know what's going inside of there uh, when a standing wave in, is created inside of a tube like this, inside of a column of air, for the sound wave, how much of the sound wave's wavelength can fit inside of the tube with, let's say, a closed end and an open end when it's producing a standing wave, when we can hear it, when it's producing a note. And so to help us figure that out, we're going to try to create standing waves, not inside of this little guy, we're going to create standing waves inside of this, um, this blue tube that's hollow and there's air inside of it, and we're gonna be able to change how large or how long of a column of air that is. And we're gonna to try to create standing waves and figure out 
how much of the sound's wavelength fits inside of that tube. So we can start to solve problems related to this. So to do that, um, instead of, you know, like we're not gonna like strike the tube uh, like I did with that small tube, uh, we're gonna introduce sound waves of known wavelength using a speaker. So let's kind of come down here and look at what, what we've got here and, and what tool we're gonna use to figure this stuff out. Here I have something that can generate signals of different frequencies and it's hooked up to the speaker and so this speaker I can make vibrate back and forth at a particular frequency. Right now um, it's set so that it's going to make the speaker diaphragm move back and forth at 100 hertz. That's back and forth 100 times each and every second. So if I turn the, the volume up we can hear that that 100 hertz sound. Uh, you probably can't see. You can see that it's shaking back and forth a little bit, but just putting my finger on there, I can tell that it's vibrating, but it's moving back and forth fast enough that we can't see something move back and forth or shake 100 times in one second. So let me dial down the frequency a little bit. Let me go down to, let's say, I don't know, about one hertz. Okay, so this is about 1.013. So you can see that when it says one hertz, this speaker is moving back and forth, like one, two, three, four, back and forth about once a second. And if I move the speaker to the side like this, you can see that diaphragm moving out and in and out and in at the frequency on our frequency generator. And if I increase the frequency, so it's a little over five, this is shaking back and forth at about five cycles per second, or five hertz. So we're gonna set up the speaker in a particular way so that we know the wavelength created by the standing wave. What I'd like to do is create a sound wave that has a one meter wavelength. So remember that the sound waves that are coming off of the speaker, no matter how quickly or how frequently you disturb the air, in room temperature air, the sound waves move at about 343 meters per second. Remember, our equation for the wavelength is wave speed divided by frequency. So if we want a one meter wavelength created by the speaker, and the velocity is moving, the speed of the sound waves are moving at 343 meters per second, if we can disturb the speaker at 343 hertz, that would be 343 meters per second divided by our 343 hertz. That would give us a one meter wavelength. So I'm gonna change this and dial this up to turn the volume down a little bit, 343 hertz. There we go. So this is the note associated with 343 hertz. Let me dial that down a little bit so we can actually hear it vibrating back and forth at that frequency. They're moving off at a speed of 343 meters per second. So the distance between the crests and the troughs of the periodic waves moving away from the speaker are now one meter in length. So let's see if we can use this setup that I've just described to see if we can even create standing waves inside of this column of air and then figure out how do the lengths that standing waves get created in compare to the one meter wavelength of the sound waves generated by the speaker. So uh, I've got the inner tube shoved all the way in, and so the end right there that the sound waves are gonna bounce off of and go this way will be very short. Um, and we're gonna kinda move it back farther and farther. And remember, we're introducing sound waves with a particular wavelength that are gonna bounce off that fixed end and go back this way. So we're going to get periodic waves, longitudinal periodic sound waves that move through one another, interfere, constructively and destructively, and hopefully at the right length, create a standing wave. How do we know when a standing wave will actually get created inside of there? We can't see the air, so we can't see regions that are like, let's say, air particles that are fixed, the nodes in the, our standing wave, or the regions, the air particles that are shaking back and forth very far from equilibrium, the antinodes. Well, let's think about how does, how do we perceive sound? Remember, when the frequency of a sound wave goes up, we perceive an increase in pitch. So the, the, the high or lowness of a sounding note is related to the frequency of the wavelength. And we're gonna be generating a constant frequency of 343 hertz. 
So if a standing wave gets created, it's going to have that same frequency. It's going to sound the same pitch. The note should sound the same. But remember, with standing waves, let's say a standing wave in a string, with a very small amplitude of disturbance at the right frequency, you can create a standing wave in a particular string of a particular length where the, this, the anti notes has much more displacement from equilibrium than your disturbance. And so if uh, this speaker is just shaking back and forth a real little bit, small amplitude of disturbance, if it can create a standing wave inside of a column of air, those anti notes, where the anti notes are, the air particles be, will be displaced much more from equilibrium than the speaker itself. And which means the sound waves that this essentially get, creates will have a larger amplitude. And if the amplitude of a sound wave is bigger, the pressure varies more because the air displacement uh, is, is more from equilibrium, that's a louder sound. And so uh, if I turn this thing on, we can get a general sense of the volume produced by this speaker. Just listen to that and get a sense of how loud that is. And as I draw this thing back, if we can find particular lengths that are much louder than what we hear now, that's evidence that at that length, there's a standing wave inside of that column of air with one open end over here and one fixed end over here. So let me start drawing this back and we'll figure out what those lengths actually are. So as the white part comes out, remember we're increasing more space for the air inside of there. So when the first standing wave was there, there was about a quarter of a wavelength that fit inside the tube. And when the second standing wave was there, there was about three quarters of a wavelength that fit inside the tube. And the last one, there was about five quarters or 1.25 wavelengths that fit inside of that length. So now we can know something quantitatively about 
what's going on to create a standing wave inside of a column of air. With one open end and one closed end, there's a quarter of a wavelength for the first standing wave, three quarters of a wavelength for the second standing wave, and five quarters for the third standing wave. Okay, lastly, I just want to look at what's actually happening inside of the air columns inside of the tubes with the three standing waves present. If we could visualize the air particles and slow things down significantly, we'd see something that kind of looks like this in the first standing wave, here for the second standing wave, and here for the third standing wave. Remember, the, the speakers are producing, well, they're vibrating at 343 hertz, so they're producing a sound wave that has that frequency, and the sound, the wavelength of that sound wave is one meter. And those sound waves are coming out of the speaker, bouncing off the back, and reflecting, and so we have periodic sound waves moving to the left from the speaker, and periodic sound waves moving to the right from the speaker, and when they interact, they interfere constructively and destructively, this is essentially what we get. We see spots that, uh, in a standing wave, like a transverse one, we get to see spots that like that don't shake up and down at all, and other spots that shake up and down a lot. Well, remember with longitudinal standing waves, the uh, pressure crests or the pressure troughs, or, or the particles are shaking back and forth parallel to the direction of travel. So the longitudinal standing wave, we get some spots that don't shake back and forth along the direction of travel and other spots like here where, where this little red dot is where the particles are shaking a lot back and forth. Okay, and so we kind of get nodes and we get anti-nodes, something that looks like this. Well, let's look, take a little bit closer look at that second standing wave where three quarters of a wavelength was present. And so uh, if we want to make a diagram <clears throat> of a longitudinal standing wave, what's happening inside of this air column, we can't draw air particles that look like this, right? And so we have to somehow have a graphical representation to represent this longitudinal standing wave. So I wanna draw your attention to a few spots first. So notice I've just located two spots where the air particles are not shaking back and forth a lot. And when we represent longitudinal standing waves graphically, we do it two ways. One, by graphing uh, the air's displacement how much it gets, gets displaced from its equilibrium position along the position of the tube, or in this case, the air column. And we also graph how the pressure varies or doesn't vary along the position of the tube. So I think the easiest one to first think about and look at is air displacement, right? Seems like the air right here, it's not getting displaced. Right here, it's not getting displaced. And so if we were to graph this here, we would imagine an a displacement node would be basically at these yellow locations. Well, what's happening in between those displacement nodes? If I put my little cursor right there, we add some new yellow lines, we can see that the particles are getting displaced a lot, the most throughout the tube from their equilibrium position. So this right here and this right here would be displacement anti-nodes. So how do we plot that or how do we graph that? Well, we graph something that looks like a sine curve that correspond to the displacement nodes where there's zero displacement from equilibrium and displacement anti-nodes that have the largest displacement from equilibrium, the air particles up here along this yellow line, right? And it'd be going from, let's say, positive to negative to positive to negative displacement, so it'd be kind of oscillating back and forth like this, but here's where the largest positive and negative displacement would be. And when we kind of graph the nodes right here, and the displacement anti-node here and a displacement anti-node here, how much of a full sine wave fits in this length? Well, if we go node up, down to here, back down, that's three quarters of a wavelength, which is what we found created the standing wave for that second standing wave. Well, um, what would be true of pressure? Uh, first, let's look at a displacement node where the particles here are not being displaced. Well, what's happening to the pressure around that? Is the pressure changing or is the pressure not changing around that position? Well, remember, pressure is related to the density of the air around a position because pressure is how much force air exerts on something for a given surface area. And if there's more air particles scrunched in the same amount of space, it's going to be pushing with more force on a given surface area. So if we look right here, you can see that they're getting squished, spread apart, squished, spread apart 
about that point. There's actually a big variation in air density over time at that position, so there's a big variation in pressure. This is actually where a pressure antinode is, right? If we drop all the way down here, the pressure is varying the most about its equilibrium pressure. So when it's scrunched the most, that's more than normal if the sound wasn't traveling through there. And when it's spread apart the most in this little animation, that's spread apart more than what's typical if there were no sound waves traveling through there. So at a pressure antinode, the pressure is varying the, or it's changing the most from the normal equilibrium pressure. Well, what about at a displacement antinode, where the displacement of the particles is significant? Kind of look up here. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but if you try to zoom out a little bit and just take a general picture of the particles, notice the particles passing through that position, the spacing of them is not changing significantly. So the density of the air particles around that position is more or less staying the same. And if the density of the air particles are more or less staying the same, guess what that means? The pressure is staying more or less the same. So at a displacement antinode where they're getting displaced the most from equilibrium, that's actually a position in the pipe or the air column where the pressure is staying about the same. It's staying at its normal equilibrium pressure, the same as if the, the sound waves or the sound standing wave was not actually in that air too. Okay, so these are two different ways that we can graphically think about what's happening inside of here. Okay, well, let's go back to all three of the standing waves that we saw or that we heard. Uh, here's the first standing wave with a quarter of a wavelength that fit in there, right here. The, in the up top here or in black is the displacement graph versus position. On the bottom is the, how the pressure varies or doesn't vary over the position. And let's just see if we can determine any general conclusions based on standing waves that are able to be created in an air column that has one closed end and one open end. Right here, the particles couldn't move back and forth. There was that, that hard plastic surface that they bounced off of. And here, they're free to move in and out if, if they want to. So what do you notice? At the fixed end, here and here and here, what is present? Well there's a displacement node because the particles, they can't physically move to the left. Um, they more or less stay in this location. So in any standing wave in an air column with a closed end and an open end, there's gonna be a displacement node on the closed end. And what's going on at the open end here, here, and here, if we look down here, that's the location of a displacement antinode. And so notice, this was the first possible standing wave because that's the first amount of a wavelength that would create a displacement node at the fixed end and a displacement antinode at the open end. The next possible one, we've got to you know, add another half of a wavelength so we can go from that antinode to another antinode. That from here to here is a half of a wavelength. And so we get three quarters of a wavelength and here the next possible one would be five quarters of a wavelength. Well, we didn't actually test it, but now that we see this pattern, and what is this pattern? It's that longitudinal standing waves have displacement nodes at fixed ends and displacement antinodes at open ends. And so what would the next logical possible standing wave that could be in this kind of a situation with a closed end and an open end? We'd have to add another half of a wavelength. So that's two fourths. And so another possible length that would allow a standing wave would be seven fourths of a wavelength, okay? And again, we could be looking or thinking about how the pressure is varying. So where there's a displacement node, there's a pressure antinode, and where there's a displacement antinode, it's being displaced the most, there's a pressure node, that's pressure staying at equilibrium. Um, for me, it's easiest to think about what's happening with the displacement nodes and antinodes because at fixed ends, they can't go anywhere, right? They can't go past a fixed end. And at an open end, that's where they're freest to move back and forth and get displaced. So uh, I would encourage you guys to think about uh, air columns in this way.